Universal Center for Renovation presents Historical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. UNCR Universal Center for Renovation. Why are we afraid to teach our history? Peasants, serfs of Europe. Unfree labor, American slavery, and Russian serfdom by Peter Cochin. Preface This book has three principal subjects Russian serfdom, American slavery, and the comparative study of unfree labor. With all three, I build upon a substantial body of recent historical scholarship. Among historians of the United States, few subjects, perhaps none, have received more sustained attention or reinterpretation during the past quarter century than Southern slavery. Among historians of Imperial Russia, the volume of works focusing on some aspect of serfdom has been equally impressive. This book is about a comparative historical study between European serfdom and African American slavery. Unfree labor. American slavery and Russian serfdom exhibited fundamental similarities and significant differences. Both were systems of unfree labor that emerged on the periphery of an expanding Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Both lasted into the second half of the 19th century, with one abolished in 1861 and the other in 1865. They were also similar as systems of bondage. Russian serfdom had, by the second half of the 18th century, become essentially a variant of slavery, much closer to American chattel slavery than to the serfdom of, say, medieval France. Russian serfdom and American slavery were similar. Russian serfdom was abolished in 1861 and American slavery in 1865. The Russian peasants or serfs and enslaved black Americans were bondmen and both suffered under chattu slavery. Unlike American slavery, for example, Russian serfdom was a largely non-racial system. That serfdom 
developed essentially racial features. The distinction between nobleman and peasant came to seem as inherent as that between white and black in America. So just the degree to which race is socially rather than biologically determined. Still, comparison illustrates how race was important in shaping the nature of Southern slavery. Both masters and slaves blurred the master, slave, white, black distinctions and came to see class relationships in racial terms. As a result, race, no matter how artificial, became an essential component of American master-slave relations. Russian serfdom had racial features. The differences between noble and peasant was inherent or hereditary, and the noble and peasant was considered two entirely different social classes and ethnic types. It was a social system based on class lines that could not be blurred or crossed. Similar to the white-black social system developed in America. Wikipedia Serfdom in Russia The term serf in the sense of an unfree peasant of Tarist, Russia, is the usual English language translation of Krepoistnoi, Krestyanin, which meant an unfree person who, unlike a slave, historically could be sold only with the land to which they were attached. Peter I ended slavery in Russia in 1723. Peter I, the Great, ended slavery in 1723, but serfdom, unfree labor, continued in Russia. A portrait of Emperor Peter the Great of Russia, 1672 to 1725. The State Hermitage Museum of St. Petersburg, Russia, 18th century. St. Petersburg, Russia. This city took its name from St. Peter the Apostle, one of the twelve disciples. The State Hermitage Museum. In this museum, you can find that portrait of Tsar Peter the Great in Petersburg, Russia. The Winter Palace, St. Petersburg, Russia. The Royal Palace of the Romanov Dynasty of Russia. Originally, that painting of Tsar Peter 
was originally housed in the royal palace of Russia. The Winter Palace served as the official residence of the House of Romanov. This portrait of Emperor Peter was originally in the Winter Palace, the Royal Palace, and moved to the Hermitage Museum in 1953. Tsar Peter I, the Great, ended slavery in Russia in 1723. Tsar Peter I was of the House of Romanov, the reigning imperial house of Russia from 1613 to 1917 the Romanov coat of arms. Tsar Peter, the great ruler of Russia, was a man of color. He was a Judeo-Syrian. The dark-complexioned aristocracy, blue bloods that ruled Europe, Tsar Peter the Great traveled to France from Russia in 1717. French documentation during the visit describes the physical appearance of Tsar Peter. This description gives us some insight to the personal lives of the monarchs of Europe and the secret origin of the 2% ruling elite of Europe. Le visite du Tsar Pierre le Grand in 1717, the Epice des Communes Nouveau, Comte. The Hosseville Review des Dormans, Tome 137, 1896. Visited of Tsar Peter the Great in 1717 from New Documents. The Tsar is of the largest stature, a little stooped, and his head leaning as usual. He is black and has something fierce in his countenance. He appears to be quick-witted and easygoing with a kind of grandeur and manner, but little sustained. He is melancholy and absent-minded, though approachable and often familiar. He is said to be robust and capable of work in body and mind. Tsar Peter the Great. He is black. Russia under Peter the Great. The Russian Empire under Tsar Peter. From study.com Did Peter the Great abolish serfdom? Peter the Great, Tsar Peter I of Russia, was one of the most impactful rulers in Russian history. Peter is most notable for his attempts to reform Russia, to make it closer to the West and more competitive with Western powers, such as Britain, 
France, and Austria? Answer and explanation. No. But he did officially end slavery in Russia. In 1723, Peter issued a decree that banned slavery and converted all slaves to serfs. In practice, this did not do much for the people in question because serfs were still subject to many of the same restrictions and hardships as slaves. Serfdom would only be officially abolished in Russia in 1861 during the reign of Alexander II. Serfs of Europe Russia's Age of Serfdom The aftermath of many of the wars and revolutions in Europe gave the serfs freedom of movement. Many decided to leave the land of their birth and seek their fortunes in distant shores. Many came to the United States of America. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the new Colossus. Wikipedia, the new Colossus. The new Colossus is a sonnet by American poet Emma Lazarus, 1849 to 1887. She wrote the poem in 1883 to raise money for the construction of a pedestal for the Statue of Liberty, Liberty Enlightening the World. In 1903, the poem was cast onto a bronze plaque 
and mounted inside the pedestals lower level. Emma Lazarus Manuscript Four, The New Colossus Text of the poem I will only read the highlighted portions. A mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning mother of exiles worldwide welcome give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore send these the homeless tempest toss to me i Lift my lamp beside the golden door. Bronze plaque inside the Statue of Liberty with the text of the poem. Immigration to the United States. Paul Auster wrote that Bartoli's gigantic effigy was originally intended as a monument to the principles of international republicanism. But the new Colossus poem reinvented the statue's purpose, turning liberty into a welcoming mother, a symbol of hope to the outcast and downtrodden of the world. John T. Cunningham wrote that the Statue of Liberty was not conceived and sculpted as a symbol of immigration, but it quickly became so as immigrant ships passed under the torch and the shining face heading toward Ellis Island. However, it was Lazarus' poem that permanently stamped on Miss Liberty the role of unofficial greeter of incoming immigrants. The poem has entered the political realm it was quoted in John F. Kennedy's book, A Nation of Immigrants, 1958. And 2019, during the Trump administration, Ken Canucci's Puccinelli, whom Trump appointed as acting director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Puccinelli added the caveat. Give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. Later suggested that the huddled masses were European. Huddled masses were Europeans. No oppressive taxes, no expensive kings, no compulsory military service, no knouts or dungeons, no kings.
the Statue of Liberty walks over a broken chain and shackle, half hidden by her robes and difficult to see from the ground. They represent freedom and the end of servitude and oppression.